Hey everyone, Brooke here, the host of Rewildology. I have a bonus episode for you today. Do you all remember the awesome Charles Von Rees in episode 37? Well, he interviewed me for the Nature Guys podcast and I have the audio to share with you all. We recorded this chat around World Tiger Day, so we're keeping with the Asiatic Big Cat theme this week. Charles and I also discussed cats in our own American backyards, tying in cats near and far. I had so much fun recording this episode, and I hope you enjoy hearing me as today's guest. All right, friends, here it is. Welcome to Nature Guys, the podcast that connects you to the exciting natural world right in your own neighborhood and sometimes way beyond your neighborhood. I'm Bob, a longtime nature lover, and recently... Charles had an opportunity for nature guys that we just couldn't turn down. He was traveling through Denver and had a chance to chat about big cats and much more with Brooke Mitchell Norman. Charles, take it away. Hi, everyone. This is Charles here for a bonus nature guys episode in Denver, Colorado. Today, I've got the pleasure of chatting with Brooke Mitchell Norman, founder and host of Rewildology, a really fantastic podcast focusing on international issues and wildlife conservation, among lots of other things. Brooke is a conservation biologist who has studied big cat conservation projects worldwide and an advocate for the effectiveness of sustainable tourism for protecting threatened wildlife. Brooke, a warm welcome to the Nature Guys podcast. And thank you so much for having the time to record with me in person, no less. In person. <laughs> this is a big <laughs> one. Uh, would you mind just telling us a little bit about your background in conservation, who you are, where you're coming from, and of course, how Rewildology itself got started? Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Charles, for coming all the way out here and meeting with me. <laughs> mid <-road currently> trip. <laughs> in my living room right now on your way down to Georgia. This is awesome. So I am a Buckeye. I am from Southern Ohio, which I think a lot of your audience yeah. is from there, which is so exciting. Go books. Yes, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's yes. a way more of a local appeal there, I think, with our group. <laughs> exactly. So I went to Ohio State and I studied zoology and then went couple different career paths there, but I also got my master's from Miami University out of Oxford, Ohio, mm. and studied conservation biology through them. And that is where I found the power of conservation travel mm -hmm. because my love are big cats and they're in a lot of peril around the world. So one of the biggest tools is conservation travel. So I decided to dedicate my career to that because if more people go out and see the world, then more big cats are going to be saved. So for sure, I did that. Yes. <laughs> and this is, of course, very relevant and timely. This past week we had, is it Global Tiger Day? What, mm -hmm. what is the Global Tiger Day? Yes, That's Global the name Tiger Day. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I understand you were, you were celebrating. I was mostly, as a wetland nerd, I was celebrating the water affinities of tigers a bunch. You had all sorts of fantastic social media outreach around the issue. That's why we're here today is to talk to you about big cats, hear from your expertise on the topic. Could you start maybe by telling us a little about Global Tiger Day and then mm -hmm. we can get into what big cats are and the real natural history of it? Yeah, yeah. So I celebrated Global Tiger Day. They are one of my favorite species. Mm. I've been to India and Nepal to see them in the wild. Oh my gosh. And I know you would have been geeking out so hard because <laughs> uh, I saw them mostly around water and, yes. and you're, the, you're the water guy. Oh, so yeah, so I was celebrating that all week long last mm -hmm. week, and the whole point of that day is to raise awareness around tigers and mm -hmm. why they're so important and so amazing for our ecosystems and why they need to be here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we can get right into that, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the thing. is like those are the important issues, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what I want to cover with you today. Is, Perfect. Is I think so many people think of tigers as... I don't know, like logos and stuff, yeah. right? For like, what is it, Mobile or Exxon? Like one of, like they one have a tiger. Those, oh my gosh. And there's like, like American Furniture Warehouse for some reason right down the road has a tiger on the side yeah, of the building. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Like, it, but, but, like, but this is an animal, right? Mm -hmm. That like plays a role in ecosystems. And, and so I think learning to appreciate the story behind the tigers themselves, the natural story, I think is really important. And, and you know so much about that. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm excited to kind of get into here. So can we talk about one of the, one of the major ways we tend to approach this on Nature Guys is really starting with especially because this isn't this is an audible 
<laughs> medium, right? We can't show pictures. Can mm-hmm. you tell us about the animal? You know, if I'm running into a tiger, which I hopefully don't, I don't Please want don't. to necessarily, but, but <laughs> what am I, what am I seeing, right? In, yes. in India or Nepal running into a tiger. Yeah. Yeah. So they are beautiful. They're the biggest big cat. So they are massive. They can the... weigh up to 660 pounds. So the Yamur oh. tiger. Yes. So this is bigger than a lion. Yes. For the record. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Yep. So it goes tiger, lion, a uh, jaguar. Those are the oh, wow. top three big cats. And so tiger is the king, literally. By like a long cats. shot, it sounds like. That's a yeah, huge animal. Yeah. So they can get really big. And of course, the, the poundage can vary quite a bit depending mm-hmm. on where you are at. So mm. southern species that are more in a warmer climate are going to be a little smaller than the big winter robust ones that are in Siberia, <laughs> Russia. Those are going to be way bigger. So big um, Amur male tigers, those are the ones that weigh up to 660 pounds. And so those yeah. are the big ones. So they're orange and they have black stripes. Right. And you would not believe how hard it is to see these animals in the wild because their camouflage is so amazing with how their stripes break up their body lines mm. in their very forested, very vegetation rich environments right. so they're very difficult to see which you would think that you would see like a 300 pound 400 yeah. pound cat it's a considerable animal you can't so like it, <laughs> yeah. is, it is a chore to find these things in the wild and so, so the stripes are primarily how they're doing that they're, they're, they, right. the image is mm-hmm. disrupted and your eye just can't yeah pick it up. they're very hard to see <laughs> okay. it's it, most of the encounters that i've had with them they have come out of the vegetation and that's when you see. Yeah, that's and you know. I've even seen them go off into vegetation and just like disappear. Just gone. And I was watching them, and they just—they're gone. So how does that <laughs> how does that work with the orange part? I yes. mean, that's, I'm thinking of like orange highlighters, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, like how do you how does a, a, an animal like that well evolve to be orange and yet still be invisible? Right. Because you would think, to our eyes, orange is a very conspicuous color. Yes. Like we can see it very, very vividly. Mm. Well, its main prey cannot see the orange spectrum. So, as mammals, we did not evolve any of the genes to be pretty much any like pretty color. There mm. are some exceptions yeah, to this. We're like brown, but for mostly, the most, right? yeah, yeah. We're brown, black, tan, and yeah. white. Like those <laughs> yeah. are like the colors that mammals evolved with. Right, right. So the next best thing for a tiger is to be a color that its prey can't see. So oh my that gosh. I know, right? <laughs> so when a deer sees a tiger, it actually sees green. Which is wild. So it doesn't see the orange spectrum. Right. And so if you can't be green as a tiger, the next best thing is to be the color that your prey can't see. So it's just green. Wow. And then so to their prey, we have the stripes to to disrupt Mm -hmm. the form of the animal. And then this orange, which to them is indistinguishable from green. So just suddenly they're, I mean, they're gone. Yes. And they're ambush predators. So they are hiding in the bush and then they wait for the very opportune moment to like spring out of wherever. Mm -hmm they're hiding and ambush their prey and run them down okay so that is what they do so all of these factors are coming into play right to hide them for as long as possible because their prey is very fast they got to get the jump yeah on. so okay. this constant evolutionary battle of who's faster than the other one right. so tigers have all of through natural history have evolved these things to make them just amazing amazing predators stealth. <laughs> yeah wow and for our listeners sake this is then I'm assuming this is as opposed to what some other predators might do, like wolves, Mm -hmm. which are kind of endurance predators, right? They will just run stuff down until it gets tired and then then murder it, basically. (laughs) Or cheetahs, which are just so darn fast, you're Mm -hmm. not going to get away, things like that. But these guys are invisible. They're gone. Boom, suddenly they're on you. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. So that is their main way of hunting their prey (laughs) is ambushing. Mm -hmm. And they're just giant. Okay. So it sounds like if they are ambushing and they are stripey and they are in the vegetation and things, this sounds like a forest animal. Where would we find tigers in terms of habitats. Absolutely. So yeah, they are the king of the jungle. <laughs> oh, like literally you know? the jungle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so when you think of like the classic jungle habitat and like yeah. the most recent jungle book on Disney is yes. actually great. The really? new version. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the old version, like the old nineties movie is really, really fun. <laughs> better songs, but, I think. <laughs> exactly. Way better songs. But from an ecological standpoint, the new one is very on point. So that kind of area that you see is very common in that kind of ecosystem. So lots of big trees or when I was at Nepal, the really big elephant grass. So anything that hides them very well. And they also love water. They're one of the only cats, big cats, that really loves water. And so you can commonly find them in very wet habitats. So like along riverbanks and around Mm -hmm. lakes, around ponds. 
So those are where you will mostly find them in Southeast Asia. So that kind of, that's that the global area. distribution. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about, and this is probably more of a question for me as a water guy, are we talking like, are they swimming in this water or they just like to be around it because the prey are there or are they really getting in there and... I mean, they love everything about it. Really? I mean, like I mentioned earlier, they almost all of the, all the wild sightings that I have had have been near water type you know, water source. It, yeah, water yeah. source of wow. some sort. Just being a classic cat. Like, they're chilling, they're laying <laughs> down, they're cooling off, they're drinking. It gets very hot where they live, and they're mm. big animals. So this is one of their ways to cool down, is to literally get into a body of water in the heat of the day. And wow. then that way they can cool down. I mean, they're not hunting during this time, so it doesn't matter if any wildlife oh. see them. Okay. So if they're just, like, laying in a nice, cool stream, they're going to be nice and cool. And then when it's time to hunt later in the day, they'll all be nice and cool down, so. Wow, so they are, and you actually just touched on a beautiful point there that I had thought of. So with most animals, you talk about where they are, but another thing to talk about is when they are, mm -hmm. right? It sounded like you were alluding to they might be nocturnal or crepuscular predators. Yes, absolutely. So they are most active when we're not awake. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so they're not easy to see yes, in that sense. Yes, exactly. Or... So they have incredible eyesight, so they can see significantly better than we can from the dusk till dawn time. Okay, so, so they start both. getting active later in the evening. So if you're like out on safari, one of the best times to see them is during the day because they usually are in oh. some, tarp, <laughs> some sort of water source cooling off. And they're just chilling out. And they're so just you... <laughs> chilling out. And they're not scared of pretty much anything. So I wouldn't they're just be. chilling out. Yeah, if I was 600 mm -hmm. pounds, I don't think I'd be scared of But anybody. if you want to see them doing something, then you don't want to be there during the day. You, okay. you would want to be there when it starts to be sunset yeah. or very early in the morning when their nighttime activities are starting to calm down. Okay, so it sounds mm -hmm. like more on the crepuscular side. Yeah, crepuscular is... to nighttime. Okay, and that, that's it's... one of those great vocab words for our listeners yes. that, that Bill has brought up a bunch of times in the past where crepuscular means you're kind of on those shoulder times. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily purely nocturnal like a bat at night. You're just at dawn and dusk, those kind of things. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. Ambush time you know that yeah. seems like a great place to do it so they're in forests they like wetlands and you mentioned nepal and india mm -hmm. right so is that pretty much the range of these animals or, or you talked about them being in the cold too i don't think of that many cold places in india but on a global scale a landscape scale what is the range of these animals like and has that changed over time or is that kind yes. of yes mm -hmm. yes great question so tigers have lost around 95 percent of their historic range Ooh. So, yeah, yeah, that's a rough stat. <laughs> that's heavy. It's hard, especially being a conservationist. That's a hard stat to really swallow. So, about the boreal forest in R Russia, so the beautiful boreal forest, all the way down. So, wow. if you think of some of the islands down, you know, in Southeast Asia, so mm. like Indonesia? Bali, okay. yeah, those type of islands. Unfortunately, most of them have lost their tigers, and so, wow. but that, that's that's how wide their range used to be from the hardy Russian boreal forest all the way down to these Indonesian islands. So yeah, they used to be all the way through that, but 95% of that area, they no longer inhabit because they've been pushed out Jeez. from habitat loss and conflict with people. So they do have some strongholds now. If you think of like India, um, India has done amazing work for really? their tiger conservation. So their numbers have gone up. When I was in Nepal, they've done some wonderful work really raising their tiger numbers and some other countries in that area, mostly through the Double Tiger Initiative. So tigers are coming back. That's slowly but news. surely. Yeah. Slowly but surely they are coming back. But yes, habitat loss has been one of their biggest threats that they've had to face over the years. And and these increases we're seeing or this progress, mm -hmm. what's that coming from? Is that from protection of habitat? So it's a range. So I'll give you a little bit of background on the sure. Double Tiger Initiative. Mm. So in 2010, the countries that recently had or currently have tiger populations came together to come with this initiative called Double Tigers, doubling the tiger numbers. Oh, so like wow. WWF and all these really big organizations plus these countries came together with the goal of the next Chinese year of the tiger in 2022, which is next year. Oh my gosh, right. Doubling tigers by that time. And so every single thing that you can think of has gone into this. Increasing habitats, creating tiger reserves, so many things. Yeah, it's multi-pronged. Oh it yeah, like. I mean, to really get into this initiative would be like an hour, two hour long thing. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But yes, yes. So that's one of the biggest drivers in the recent years of how we've seen tiger numbers really start to come up. 
So next year we'll see what the actual number is. And I think we're about like the last stat was hopefully around like 4,000 tigers. Wow. In that area, area. we don't sure. know until the actual census is going to be yeah, done. Yeah. I mean, counting things in nature is hard. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. And especially when you think of the landscape of where these cats actually oh, are true. and getting to where they are. So lots of things. I've met some of the people in Nepal that are doing some of these numbers and, those, and these counts, You're which right, is really right. exciting. Yeah, you've got but, an amazing series of interviews. What was it called? Living with Big... Close. It was Nepal coexisting Co with giants. Coexisting with giants. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Because we yeah. really dove into living with tigers, greater one-horned rhinos, and elephants. And those are none some of those species are easy. Oh, and we also talked about the Himalayan black bear. Oh, right. And some other species that are not easy to live with. So, yes, it was a very interesting series yeah. on my podcast. I, I had <laughs> to plug I that one. Oh, yeah, I you. really enjoyed that. Just being out in the field and hearing from all these. I mean on the ground, local conservationists. Yes, yes. That was incredible. They're all Nepali that I met with. I mean, it was a wide range, like Sam Helly, she's a, here in the US doing unbelievable work. Yeah. And then Jack Ken Ross, he's over there um, as well. So he's a Kiwi, he's from New Zealand. Oh yeah, and I then, love the accent. Oh, he was amazing. And then yeah, the rest of everyone else was local Nepali. So it was a great blend of different voices that are all talking about this one issue. So it was intense yeah. <laughs> to I, say the least. <laughs> I, I loved it. That was that was a fantastic addition to my road trip. So. Yeah. <laughs> so a few more details maybe on tigers specifically before we start to branch out into some other issues. Real quick though, so we know that they're big predators, they run down big old prey by ambushing them and stuff like that. So I wanted to talk about their role in the ecosystem as these big giants that eat stuff. If, if they were to disappear, what are the impacts there? What mm -hmm. kind of larger effect do they have on the landscape and the forests of which they are a part? Absolutely. So they are an apex predator and a keystone species. Mm -hmm. So they have an abnormally large effect for the biomass that they have I see, and, right, right. and the cascade that the trophic cascade that they're the very, very top. They said they're the apex predator. And so within there, the entire ecosystem is in balance. Mm. So they take out your large herbivores. Right. Know, so those large deer species that most other predators cannot take down. <laughs> You know, they just can't, yeah, they just I can't mean, take them down. 600 pounds. I, 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 yes, I see exactly. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So some of their main prey are servants. So those are your big animals. So like your gower. I don't know if you've seen the big black cows that you see in India. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. So those, so they can take those hunking mm -hmm. things down. So and like you mentioned cervids, right? Which for our listeners, those are things in the deer family. Right. right? right so the big in one. our backyard, we've got white-tailed deer yes. where we are now we've got mm -hmm. elk and things but those are those are cervids right yes, in, in, yes. in their range there's a bunch of native yeah species. yeah yeah so okay. like sambar deer those are really big so if you think of an elk so a sambar deer is around that size and oh so, my gosh yeah, they're huge wow yeah yeah and and they they can take them down so when you remove tigers out of the ecosystem the entire thing can collapse yeah these larger herbivores their populations skyrocket they are overeating all the vegetation and then also too as you know being in like these wet areas oh, true. then then some of the area the degrades uh, like oh, like riverbanks degrade is because everything is over grazed right right and the whole entire thing collapses because there's no other predators in the area that can take down these large herbivores yeah so that sounds like a real genuine keystone species right we, we've had a couple episodes uh with bob and gia talking mm, about mm -hmm. keystone species and why they're so important and this this sounds like an excellent example right uh to add to that to that list so that's fantastic you were telling me a bit, a bit of a story earlier about how other species are interacting with mm, the tigers mm -hmm. and how tigers can kind of, they're almost monitored, it sounds like. Yes. Uh, which, I thought that was the coolest natural history story. I'd love to, to relay that to our listeners here. Yeah, so just the natural world ganging up with each other to let everybody know when there's a big tiger in the area. So monkeys can see the color orange so ah, one we're, we're common monkeys thing, so we exactly. can see orange so okay. we can see orange i get that and langurs can as well langurs and this yep. is a group of southeast asian monkeys mm -hmm. right a whole family of yep, monkeys yep. Are... hanuman langurs yes hanuman and so uh, okay. they're the big silvery ones with long arms that you see commonly on like david attenborough and bbc okay. documentaries and they're very 
commonly partnered with spotted deer and they can see orange with the when the deer can't oh my gosh and they're in trees so they're looking down surrounding all of the area right. and they are the best alarm calls of all time like you want to be around these langers like security cameras exactly I mean. <laughs> so they can see orange and they are up in the trees so they will um, the moment they spot anything that, that looks like a predator like a big cat or a leopard their alarm call will go off and then the deer will just go and like they're like, <laughs> on a, like high alert and then all eyes will be on wherever the langer alarm call was right and then they will act accordingly so yeah it's a lot of things going against the tiger Jeez, and everybody for, knows that means tiger. Absolutely. Then, uh, so the langers have this very specific call that is only for predators. Oh, it's wow. It's only for big cats. And they only make that noise when they see a cat, which is crazy. When I was in Nepal, I actually got to experience this as we were tracking down a leopard. And we knew a leopard was there because we saw its tracks. And then we also heard the langers alarm call. The leopard was very amazing at being sly and sneaky. <laughs> and we never found it after 45 minutes of trying. Oh, Oh my gosh and then we gave up we're like okay yeah you yeah. are clearly just not gonna let us you're gonna see your, your presence yeah. no. so to be in the wild and hear their alarm call firsthand was really amazing i'm shaking the trees and everything yeah. just to let everybody know that there was a leopard in the area i think that's such a phenomenal example of the way that animal behavior can really affect how you study nature when you're out in your own backyard you know if you hear a commotion or something or bird calls that are unusual, sometimes it's worth going to check it out because those animals are a lot more aware than we are. And one of the reasons I love this story so much is because it actually has a perfect parallel in our backyards here in North America. I'm a bit of a bird watcher and black capped chickadees and other types of chickadees actually do the same thing that the langers do where they hang around in the canopy a lot and they're super curious just like monkeys and they check everything out and when they see something that they see as a problem they also make a particular call and everybody tunes into it i've actually repeatedly found hawks and owls that were sleeping by hearing this sound and following the chickadee commotion so i think it's a great Isn't parallel it amazing like how like this same solution has evolved in so many different ways because that's exactly what i mean a tiger could literally be laying in a, a riverbed obviously Chilling. not at all interested in hunting yeah. in any way but if anything sees it their alarm calls will still go off yeah which I, makes it awesome when you are <laughs> doing conservation and travel ecotourism You're like alarm call go yeah right. you know exactly where to go from there yeah. you're, you're mm -hmm. not gonna have to bumble around looking for them mm -hmm. that's incredible it's awesome you don't have to rely just on your binoculars yeah well and you were just underhand pitching me the perfect <laughs> softball here of to, to move on to one of our other topics today that we'll touch on it briefly and of course there's a lot more to this and i would encourage listeners to check out your podcast for much more in-depth discussion of this but i know that conservation travel is a huge part of what you do and a huge part of your prescription for protecting a lot of this large wildlife what is conservation travel what is wildlife tourism and the mechanics of why uh, it's so helpful. We do have an earlier couple of episodes, I think, with Bill and Bob from a few years ago talking about wildlife travel and tips for doing it and things like that. It is an awesome industry and one that's getting, I think, increasingly uh, sophisticated and, and more aware of equity issues and things like that, which is so important. And having you here to talk a little bit about it, I think, is phenomenal for our listeners. If this stuff gets you excited, because it gets me totally pumped. And you do such a good job of, of talking with so many experts on your podcast about it. But yeah, but please, give, give us Conservation Travel 101. Yes. The reason why conservation travel is so powerful, it's one of like the most powerful tools in the conservation tool belt, mm. is because it places economical value on wildlife being alive and thriving than dead and degraded oh, as wow. much as we wish the world evolved around unicorns and rainbows it just doesn't <laughs> if there is no monetary value on keeping that tiger alive especially with as much conflict as it causes or any other megafauna or a natural area it is going to be destroyed because Otherwise, that is a quick buck that someone can make in the local community. Right. But if you're bringing tourism dollars and what everybody that is coming there to see is to see that animal alive and thriving and right. healthy and right. beautiful, then it'll be protected. I It'll see. stay there. And there will be other forms of income. 
that won't never necessarily rely on natural resources. Right. That it's just because of that wildlife being there. And so you and I, for example, when you do, which is, this is going to happen, Charles <laughs> is going to come with me to Africa and I'm going to show this to you firsthand, is the power of it, is the yeah. power of when you are bringing people from all over the world or domestically, like here in the US, mm -hmm. a lot of domestic and international travel, like, you know, our national parks are a really good example of when you're bringing tourism dollars to an area by virtue of that money coming into the area, yeah. it'll be saved. It'll be protected because it is worth more than the alternative. And the alternative mm. is destroying it. And it's sustained, right? I assume mm -hmm. that that money is going to keep coming. Exactly. Whereas if you're just selling, I don't know, tiger body parts or something. Exactly. When you run out of tigers, that's it, right? I mean, exactly. It's a very limited resource. When that one tiger, let's say this beautiful male is in an area and he lives the 10, 15 years and people know that he's there and then let's say that you're a tour guide right. and you know this is his territory. Yeah, like what pond like to find him chilling Like how many in? times can you bring a group to go see him? And that's how much money is being put into the local economy. Sure. I mean, travel is one of the largest industries in the world. In oh the world. Yes, a lot of the world relies on tourism as its form of income. So I yeah. fully believe in it. When it's well done, there are some issues in some areas. So I'm not I'm not saying that this is like the answer yeah, for everything. It's not everything. A panacea necessarily. Exactly. But, there's certainly... but it's a very strong tool. It seems like a it. very strong tool when it's done the right way with the right companies, with the right sustainable culture. And when all th things are thought through, it is such an amazing thing for wildlife and the cats that I love the most that are in trouble everywhere. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It seems mm -hmm. like a great fit for them. Yeah. And again, we have at least one nature guys episode specifically giving people travel tips on like how to be not only safe, but, but ethical in how you do it. And also how to find the best wildlife and stuff. A lot of advice from Bill who was very seasoned in that. So I encourage people to check that out as well. So the last thing I wanted to pick your brain about is we're talking a lot about big cats, these major predators in very far away places. And as we know, travel can be expensive. So I figured it might also be cool to talk a little bit about our backyards. Do we have big cats here? Are there things in our very large continent that we could be looking at that, that, that are pertinent to the same themes that we've been discussing with tigers? Uh, who are our American big cats. What do we got going on? Yeah, yeah. So we definitely have some awesome kitties here and I love <laughs> all of them. So we have the classic mountain lion or right. cougar or catamon or puma, depending on where you are. Just all the names. Yes, apparently. all the names because they have one of the largest home ranges of any mammal in the world. It's really? amazing. Oh, they wow. are found from like middle Canada all the way to the southern tip of South America. Their what? range is unbelievable. So they go through like Patagonia and all the, that. Literally. Actually, Patagonia oh is one of the best places to see them. Really? And So that's another trip I'm going to be doing here pretty soon. <laughs> if you just want to like tag yeah, along I mean, with me, just me let in. me know. Count me just in. Just let me know. I know wow. some researchers who collar them there. So oh my gosh. we can do that. So this is uh, their distribution is huge. Yes, it's and massive. Then, like, their home ranges as individuals, they, they cover a lot of space too. Yeah, yeah. So it, it definitely depends on like where they are. Sure. They are a very opportunistic big cat, which is how they have gotten such a wide range. There's very few ecosystems that you won't find them in. Wow. All the way from middle Canada, like, you know, we're talking about like Alberta. And stuff. That's very all different. All the way down yeah. through Latin America, through our United States all the way down to the southern tip of like Argentina and Chile. It's oh amazing. Gosh. So they are beautiful. They are amazing cats. They're heavily misunderstood, mm. especially in our country. But also what we have here is jaguars are starting to kind of creep up a little bit into the southern, southern states here in the U.S., which is very exciting. They're coming up from Mexico. So, but that's, that's a recent development. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes uh, through conservation efforts. Right. So we go at the meso predator level. So that's the next level down ah, in our cats. Good vocab word yes. there. Yeah. So I love when I hear meso predator, I love to think of middle predator. So yes. who's not the apex, yeah. who's the smaller one down. And so now we're I talking see. about our lynx and our bobcats. Ah, and same so, genus, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. They actually look really similar. And, Interesting. And it's, 
Sometimes it's easy to get them mixed up of which one is which. But yeah, bobcats are the smaller ones. They have long legs, beautiful tufts on their ears. Right. And those are the ones that we will, well, it's actually really hard to see them. But yeah. those are the ones in our backyards. They're <laughs> around, right? Like they're they really are, out there. They are really around. They are also great opportunistic little kitties. They take down anything that they can that is in like, you know, their size of what they hunt, rabbits, Birds and stuff, yeah, I assume. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Okay. And some of the bigger ones, because they can get up to like 37 pounds. So if you think of like, you hey. know, like a coyote or yeah. something like that, they can get up to that it's, size. It's a small dog. Yeah. So they can take down small deer, which wow. is awesome. Wow. Which is so cool. But that's not common. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not common. They're going for the smaller things that are way easier to yeah. take down. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, well, push it. Yeah. So those are the ones that are, are commonly in our backyards. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So if people want to learn about big cats or even try to see them in some way or study them in their own backyard locally. Mm -hmm. How do you, how does one go about learning about big cats? So since they are so they don't like us. Yep. So they will do everything for us not to be able to see them. Mm -hmm. So, and they're also very active at night and dusk and dawn. So they, they are crepuscular as well. Okay. So some of the best times is to get up early, early in the morning and to go see if you can find them in any, um, like uh, habitats that you think that they're in, or if you go online and look at some of maybe where the recent maps have been of where you've, where some have been spotted I or see. found yeah. like wild, uh, like wildlife refuges or anything that might be in your backyard that would be a really good habitat for your big cats. Um, winter time is the best time really? to look for cats because you can find their tracks. So what's mm. really cool about when you're trying to find cat tracks is their claws are retractable. So when you're looking for tracks, if you see claws, that is not a cat. But if you see four little pads and then the big pad yeah. that's at the bottom of their foot right. is shaped like an upside down W. So it ah. has three lobes. So if okay. you see three lobes, four little toes, no nails, you know you have a cat. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So tracking is probably the best bet. It yes, like. okay. especially in the snow. So I, mud or snow or... Yes. Okay. That is the absolute best time. Like being here in the Rockies, that is my favorite time to go out and oh, go like that. snowshoeing and yeah, stuff. Yeah. First thing in the morning, try to get on the trail to see who has been there. And that is how you know if you have a cat or not. Oh my gosh. Well, there you go. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a fantastic way to do it. I, I'm going to have to go try that soon myself. Yes. In Georgia, who knows what kind of like I'll have, but that's, <laughs> that's awesome. So then lastly, people who are interested, locally speaking, how can folks do something to help? We know that big cats are in trouble worldwide and lots of things are being done, but how can, how can we get involved uh, and contribute in some way? So my number one thing is education is power. Do what you can to do some research online. If there's a particular species that you love a lot, maybe learn more about them and the mm. top organizations that are doing the best to save them in the wild. Okay. And then locally, most states have amazing accredited AZA facilities. So these are like your zoos and aquariums. Mm -hmm. So AZA is Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And these are like your creme de la creme. <laughs> they are amazing. They are doing some amazing work for wild populations. So to be a part of the AZA, one of the things that they have to do is a certain percent of their profits must go to wildlife conservation around the world. Oh, wow. So they have to. And what's even crazier is only 10% of the 2,800-ish facilities that are registered with the USDA are AZA accredited. So these are like is a the top group. organizations. Yeah. And you can go to aza.org and see what organizations that are around you that have this accreditation. The uh, sanctuaries also have a similar accrediting body. It's called the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. And I highly recommend looking online before you would go to some sort of wildlife type experience or animal experience and see if the organization has either of these accreditations. Okay. Because sometimes it's hard to know if some place that you see is good or not, or if they're helping wildlife or not. Yeah, right. And to help just make it easier on yourself, and not have any question because online people can lie, you know, you yeah. just don't know. But if an organization has either of those accreditation, then you know that they're okay. good. They're good. Yeah, yeah. So those are my top recommendations. If you have a species you really love, see who is supporting them in the wild. Support that organization however you can. I know that money might be tight right now. So volunteering or just getting the word out, saying something on social media about your cat or 
friends and family, like if you really love snow leopards, this organization is doing something for snow leopards or the exact same thing, going to your local AZA or your accredited sanctuary and see how you can help tigers that way. Just by going, then yeah. you know that some of your money is going to help wildlife. So mm -hmm. that's great. So we've obviously covered a lot and there's plenty more. So I imagine an episode like this, this is really going to whet a lot of people's appetite for stuff having to do with big cats, conservation travel, everything you do pretty much. I mean, this is cool stuff. How can people follow you uh, and get in touch with you or, or see what else you have going on? So the easiest way is to just check out the podcast. It's called Rewildology. It has this very bright logo <laughs> with the links that has pink glasses and big yellow headphones on. So it's very easy to find um, and spot the podcast. So it's on Instagram. That's one of the easiest ways to get a hold of me. It's just at Rewildology. I promise that is also me. <laughs> I, I'm the one that runs all social media for the podcast so if anybody wants to get a hold of me that's probably the yeah. easiest way Direct there's line. a website and then it's on all of your podcast places that you would find it spotify itunes podbean stitcher <laughs> and even some of my episodes uh, there's a video component as well that you can oh, wow. see on youtube so not all of them but i'm trying to grow that as well so that's if great. someone prefers youtube it's all the exact same thing so that's that's the best way to so just listen to the pod wherever you are or just get a hold of me and i'd love to chat with anybody so <laughs> <sighs> well thank you so much brooke for, for having the time to, to chat with me i super appreciate it we will go ahead then and sign out in the traditional nature guys fashion which i have given you some lessons here in how to do it so we'll see how well we do here until next time everyone we will say step, step outside, outside and, and stay, stay a while, while. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.